Hello and welcome! In the last video I installed a CPU socket on this main board and upgraded it to a Harris 286 at 20MHz. To be able to clock the CPU I also had to replace the crystal oscillator, which I socketed to make it easy to try different clocks. As I did that I also installed a socket for a second optional oscillator and in this video I would like to talk about that and see how far I can upgrade this board. This board has a unique feature to support DIP and SIM memory simultaneously, which is already completely populated as you see with 2 MB of RAM in total. Theoretically even up to 5 MB would be possible if I would use 4 times one megabyte SIMs, but 2 MB are already more than enough for the 286. As I already mentioned, the CPU has been upgraded from an AMD 16 MHz to a Harris 20 MHz. Unfortunately, the system didn't post at 25 MHz, but 20 MHz is also quite fast for a 286. And now let's talk about the next upgrade, which goes into this socket. What is it actually for? An x86 CPU was initially optimized for calculations with integer numbers, which include positive and negative natural numbers as well as zero. Of course, it could also make calculations with a subset of real numbers, known as floating point numbers in computer science, but that was slower by a huge margin. So back then most software was implemented using integers for whole numbers and rational numbers for fractions, which were basically also just integers representing numerator and denominator. However, that made the software complicated and demand for fast floating point calculations grew in many areas of the industry, especially computer-aided design, uh, financial calculations and so on. And for such use cases a so-called coprocessor was introduced, also known as a floating point unit or FPU which could be used as an upgrade to support the CPU in floating point calculations. For a 286 CPU Intel provided a 287 FPU which supported different clocks. First model came as 6, 8 and 10 MHz variants. The 10 here in the end says that I have a 10 MHz version in my collection. The clock on this board is provided by this crystal oscillator. The CPU runs at half of the clock and the FPU at one third. Since I upgraded this board with a 40 MHz oscillator, the CPU would run at 20 MHz and the FPU at about 13 MHz, which is more than 10 MHz for which this FPU is specified. For the first test, I would like not to overclock the FPU and stick to 10 MHz. That's why I'm going to put back the original 32 MHz oscillator, which would bring the effective FPU clock down to nearly 10 MHz and the CPU to 16 MHz. Before we start, let's make a test run without the FPU. As you see, Landmark Speed Test doesn't report any FPU and skips the test. The 286 CPU is properly detected though at 16 MHz. Check it does the floating point calculations on the CPU if no FPU has been detected. And uh, we are getting here 69.5 thousand whetstones. This is a relative benchmark value, which represents how often a set of floating point operations has been iterated per second. We have nearly 70,000 iterations. So now let's put the 287 FPU into the socket and repeat the tests. Now Landmark Speed Test reports an FPU and tells that it runs at 12 MHz. This is actually not a real MHz number. Just like with the uh, CPU, it is a clock with which an original IBM XT PC with an 8088 CPU and an 8087 FPU would have to run to match the performance. So in the future I'll call it points instead of megahertz to avoid any confusion. In check it we are now getting 456 and half thousand whetstones, which is about 6.5 times faster than the 70,000 which we got without an FPU. This is already quite an improvement, but we are at the beginning. 
Now let's install a 40 MHz oscillator to clock the CPU at 20 MHz. As I explained previously, the FPU will be overclocked now to 13 MHz since it runs with uh, one third of the clock. Now in landmark speed test, the FPU speed rose from 12 to 15 points. Notice that the CPU is detected properly at 20 MHz. In check it, the math speed is also nearly 100,000 whetstones higher, and also the dry stones, which represent the integer performance, is about 30% higher at 4361. Also here, the CPU is reported to run properly at 20 MHz. Okay, we seem to be lucky that this 287 FPU is a good overclocker. 13 MHz doesn't sound like a lot, but that's still 30% overclocking. I mentioned previously that this FPU was also produced as 6 and 8 MHz versions. Imagine I'd have one of those. Most probably a 6 MHz 287 wouldn't be able to run at 13 MHz. That uh, would be an overclock by over 200%. So what to do in such a case? That's why most 286 and 386 mainboards have a place for a secondary oscillator, which can be used to clock the FPU asynchronously. Imagine this FPU wouldn't be able to run at 13 MHz, then I can switch the jumper to select the second oscillator and insert the 32 MHz one in addition to the 40 MHz, which would continue to clock the CPU. This way, I could keep the CPU at 20 MHz and use a slower FPU at 10, 8 or even 6 MHz by choosing a cordon crystal oscillator at 30, 24 or 18 MHz. Thanks to a generous donation from Stibor from Slovakia, I'm also a lucky owner of this Intel 287 XL FPU, which has been made later in more modern manufacturing process and is actually a backport of a 387 FPU. This FPU can remain stable at higher clocks, so let's see what we get there. Let's go back to single 32 MHz oscillator and repeat the tests with the 287 XL. Now in landmark speed test, the CPU runs again at 60 MHz, that's fine, but look at the FPU results. We get almost 30 points. That is nearly twice the speed we got with the other FPU at theoretically higher clock. Or did we? Well, check it also reports over 800,000 uh, whetstones, which is also about 30% faster than what we got before. Now let's use the 40 MHz oscillator. In landmark speed test, we get 37 points. In check it, we already crossed the 1 million whetstones. Remember that on the same system without the FPU, we got just around 70,000. That's almost 15 times faster floating point calculations. But why is this 287XL so much faster than the previous model? Is it because some improvement in the algorithms? As I said, 287XL is actually a backported 387FPU. Maybe Intel used some math magic there? Well, not really. Since a more modern manufacturing process has been used to build 287XL, it didn't get as hot and could potentially stand higher clocks as the previous versions. As I mentioned a couple of times before, per default, this 287 ran at one third of the supplied clock. But that is not completely true. In the datasheet for the older Intel 287 FPU, there is something interesting mentioned regarding pin 39. CKM, or clock mode signal, is an input which is used to set up the FPU clock. It indicates whether the clock is to be divided by 3 or used directly. Per default, this pin is pulled down internally and selects one third clock mode. However, if this pin is pulled up externally, the FPU will use the clock directly. Now, if we look into the datasheet of the 287XL, I see we can find that this FPU runs at half the clock instead of third, if the CKM pin is not pulled high. 
So the magic behind the higher performance is in the higher effective clock rather than optimizations. Though, to be fair, we can see a better manufacturing process also as an optimization. But the point is that 287XL is faster because it clocks faster. This topic brought the user i440BX from the German DOS Reloaded community to an idea. He proposed to override the clock settings for such FPUs to be able to select between direct and reduced clock. Most mainboards don't have a jumper for that, so he came up with an interposer prototype which could be put between the FPU and the mainboard. I found the idea useful and with some little changes and the allowance of i440BX, I created a project 287 booster on GitHub. On many boards just a simple resistor would do the job and this project seems to be an example for over-engineering. However, there are 286 boards where pin 39 is permanently grounded, so that pin on the FPU would be needed to be bent out of the socket, so the resistor could be soldered to that. Such an interposer is of course a lot cleaner solution. You can find the link in the description. There you can find the keycard project and accordant Gerber files. So with a single 40 MHz oscillator, the 287XL runs at 20 MHz, just as the CPU. To remind you, with that setting we got around 37 points in Landmark and 1,058,000 whetstones in Checkit. Can we get it even higher? Let's set the jumper on the 287 booster to clock the FPU at full speed. That means it would run at 40 MHz, twice the clock of the CPU. And here we go, the system is unstable. Landmark doesn't even start. And the system completely locks up. 40 MHz is definitely too much. Luckily, I installed the socket for the secondary oscillator. Let's put the 32 MHz clock oscillator there and set the jumper so the FPU uses that clock. The jumper on the 287 booster remains closed, so the clock should be still taken directly and the FPU should now run at 32 MHz. Now the system is stable again and in landmark speed test we get over 42 points. Remember, the CPU is now working at 20 MHz asynchronously and the FPU runs at 32 MHz. Theoretically, I should be able to get the same speed using 66 MHz secondary oscillator without 287 booster. Let's take a look at check it. Over 1.1 million whetstones. This is an impressive result. Probably I could even get a little bit higher by trying other clocks between 32 and 40 MHz, but I have no oscillators in that range. Anyway, I think this is a nice result already. But the most important question is, what's the point of doing this? Well, first of all, of course, because we can and like to learn more about computer history. When talking about usefulness, well, it's complicated. Back in the days, there was a lot of professional software, computer-aided design, scientific and financial applications, and other software which could benefit from an FPU. However, contrary to a popular belief, a coprocessor didn't automatically make your computer run faster. The software had to be developed and compiled with FPU usage in mind. For professional software, that was often the case. But private users usually didn't have a coprocessor in their PCs because it was quite expensive. So most software, especially games, were not developed for systems with an FPU. Performance-hungry games like Wolfenstein 3D or even Doom later didn't benefit from an FPU in any way. They simply didn't use floating point calculations to avoid necessity for an FPU. The CPUs up to 486SX didn't have an integrated FPU and first with 486DX it got included. That is basically the difference between SX and DX on a 486. The first widely known game which started to require an FPU was Quake. That's why it will simply crash on any system without an FPU. But was there a game for early PCs which didn't require an FPU but could still benefit from it? Well, as I said, the software had to be developed and compiled so it can use an FPU. Most game developers 
didn't even bother, but such games existed, although not many. I know of Falcon 3 and SimCity. On a 286 with an FPU, SimCity feels a bit snappier. Without FPU, the game tends to stutter and freeze for a second or two if bigger events are happening in the game. So this is one of the rare examples where a game can benefit from an FPU on a 286. Otherwise, an FPU on a 286, 386 and 486 was of course mostly only interesting for professional applications. And still, it is very interesting today to feel the open sockets um, on such a 286 mainboard and experiment with it. And this is it for today. I hope this was interesting. Thank you for watching and goodbye.